you guys doing? You guys have a good break? Or oh, I close the morning, should we have a good break? <laughs> well, I hope you guys are excited to be back. We are excited to be back, and it's always good to see you. Uh, welcome if you're here for the first time, but if you've been here, as always every Wednesday, we are always excited to see you guys back here. Um, and so we will continue with just our program as per usual. Um, and just after I sit down, Jeremiah is going to come up and um, give us today's sermon. But before we start, I'd like to read um, for us Matthew 5, Matthew chapter 5 from verse 43 to 48, which is page... Five. Well, wait, no. Page six um, of the New Testament. <clears throat> you have heard that it was said, "Love your neighbor and hate your enemy." But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And not even the tax collectors doing that. And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jeremiah, you can come. Great to see everyone. Um, Good to be back at Howard. I still love your buildings. Every time I see that law building, Ooh, it's lovely. You should have um, a postcard of those buildings. Yeah, I think that'd be good. That'd be <laughs> nice. Um, so I don't know who it is. Um, let me pray. This is not an easy passage to. It's easy to understand. It's tough to take to heart. So we're gonna let's ask for God's help. Father, we pray that you would do a powerful work by your Holy Spirit in our hearts through your Word. This afternoon. Please soften our hearts. Please even break our hearts. Please give us broken, contrite hearts that you will not despise. Change us, Lord, through your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, I'm sure you've probably seen this past Easter a few days ago, there were some uh, Islamic zealots or terrorists who, in Sri Lanka, an island off the tip of India, uh, coordinated a massive attack targeting Christians, and these bombers killed about 310 plus uh, people, most of whom were Christians, in church buildings on Easter Sunday, worshiping their risen Lord. Imagine 310 of us, in, it was actually multiple buildings, but imagine that, 310 of us in this room coming to a talk and being blown to pieces. Just imagine, if you can, if it's possible, um, if one of your dearest family members or uh, friends was one of the 310, whose life was suddenly and senselessly snuffed out. Now, just imagine, you're, you're going to church that morning, you're enjoying your loved one's smile, and suddenly he or she is no more. In an irreversible instant, your whole world shatters into a million pieces, and hours later, as you still can't get any words out, all you can do is sob. You receive the news, maybe from CNN or something, that it was, an it was a terrorist attack, and you see photos of ISIS or whoever uh, claiming responsibility for the attack. Well, if you expected a light, a light lunchtime talk, I'm sorry. Um, I don't really like starting on such a heavy note, and I know that's a, a heavy way to start. But if we're going to grasp how unique Jesus is, how unique his teaching is, we need to be real. And this is what is really happening in the world, not just in Sri Lanka, but in Nigeria, in Kenya, all around the world. And we also have people who don't like us. You have enemies. And so we need to be real. In this passage, Jesus says, it's pretty clear what he's saying. He's saying, love your enemies. And he spoke these words to his disciples some of whom would suffer the same exact sort of, per not exact, the same persecution that just happened in Sri Lanka, that sort of thing. He's saying, love your enemies, those sort of enemies, Jesus teaches. That's the point of the passage. You can see it. Um, oops, sorry. I'm jumping ahead a bit. There we go, that's okay. 
The point is right here. Love your enemies to show that you are God's child. That's the point. It's pretty simple. Uh, easier said than done, though, right? You know, Mark Twain, who's an American writer, he said, it's not the part of the Bible that I don't understand that troubles me. It's the part of the Bible that I do understand that troubles me. And you can relate to that in this passage. See, what's your response to this, honestly? You don't have to say it out loud, but think about it. What's your response? For me, you know, love your enemies raises questions in my heart, and I bet it does in yours. And we'll engage with two common objections. You can see one of them right there that you or a friend may have about this. But before we dig in, let's just get our bearings in, in Matthew's Gospel. Jesus is teaching his, what is now a very famous Sermon on the Mount. And he is speaking to his disciples about what it looks like to live under his rule, under his righteous rule. You could call this whole Sermon of the Mount a kingdom manifesto. And his theme is not make the kingdom great again, or something about jobs and land. His, his theme is true righteousness. And if you look at chapter 5, verse 20, it's, it's really a key verse in this whole sermon. Just if you have a Bible, if you don't mind looking down at chapter 5, verse 20. He's saying that he demands from his followers a righteousness that far exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and teachers of the law. He says, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that would have shocked the people of the day, because the Pharisees, these religious leaders, were known as very righteous people. But if you look at what they were doing, <laughs> they thought they were morally upright. But no, they were actually relaxing the law's demands so that they could keep man-made rules, and, therefore, and then congratulate themselves for feeling righteous. It's a bit like, you know, let's say you had the power to lower the standards at Howard College, and you can lower the pass rate to 20% so that everyone could, gradu uh, could graduate and then kind of congratulate yourselves that we're so, such great students. Well, that's what the Pharisees were doing with righteousness, if you will. And from, if you look at chapter 5, verse 21, all the way to the end of chapter 5, our, our text, What's going on is Jesus is contrasting his true righteousness, his true interpretation of God's law, with the slack way that the Pharisees interpreted the law. Just look at chapter, uh, 5, verse 21. You can see this, this pattern continues. He, uh, he's, Jesus says, You heard that it was said, do not murder, and then, but I say to you, dot, dot, dot. And that pattern, you've heard it was said, but I say to you, continues throughout this whole section all the way until we reach our passage. Now look at uh, verse 43. Jesus says, again, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So the traditionalists, the popular religious leaders, taught this. They taught you shall love your neighbors. Which, is that what the Bible teaches? You shall love your neighbor. Yes, yes it is. You can read it in Leviticus 19, verse 18. But, notice what they did, these traditional religious leaders, they added, and hate your enemy. That is not taught anywhere in the Old Testament, the Law of Moses. Now, why did they add, hate your enemy? Well, we don't know exactly. We, they added it, though, because... It's easy to do. Imagine patting yourself on the back for feeling righteous because you hate someone. That's a pretty low standard, isn't it? I mean, what is more natural than hating your enemy? It's easy. Now, before we condemn these guys, uh, we have our own twisted versions of this sort of thing. You know, you'll meet some people who will say, you know, I love the elect. I love those who I think are God's people, but I hate sinners. That's lame. That's easy to do. Or what about those, you know, identity politics? It's, it's, it's obvious. People do it all the time. I love people who are just like me, who are in my group, but I'm going to hate everyone else, and I'm going to feel righteous about doing it. There's nothing special about that. It's just their religious traditions. And in verse 44, Jesus demands 
that his followers aim for a higher standard of righteousness. You can see it in verse 44. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That is what he says. And notice he does not just say tolerate your enemies. Actively love them. Bless your enemies. Seek what's best for your enemy. Do good to your enemy and its enemies. Anyone who's your enemy. Now I wonder if you're sitting here, who do you think your who do you think's your enemy? Who would you consider an enemy? Maybe it's a you guys are looking at you guys are looking at each other. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you consider an unfair, harsh lecturer your enemy. Or someone from a different culture your enemy. Or a rival student who competes against you. Or a rival political party. Or whoever. Uh, and the thing is often People who we perceive to be our enemies, it's actually motivated by our own heart's envy and prejudice and pride, which we all have. But here, Jesus is describing real enemies. People who actually hate, uh, hate us. People who express hostility and hatred against Jesus' people. People who, he says, persecute you. People who attack your family on Easter Sunday while you're worshiping. Love them. This is shocking. It's shocking. Love students who ignore you and mock you because you refuse to participate in the things that they like to do, the sin. I'm sure you've experienced that if you're a follower of Jesus, something like that. Love family members who call you names and threaten to cut off your funding because you follow Jesus. And one of the most practical ways to love our enemies is right there in verse 44. Pray for those who persecute you. Now, I'm sure you've noticed on social media that after a terrorist attack or a mass shooting, uh, people post, you know, I'm praying for Sri Lanka, and maybe with a colorful frame around the profile picture with a flag of a place that's been uh, attacked. You know, hashtag pray for Sri Lanka. <coughs> And a growing number of people are kind of reacting against that. And they're criticizing this kind of hashtag sympathy as nothing more than a cheap substitute for concrete action. And they kind of have a point. There is a lot of pretend compassion out there. But the secular critics are wrong when they say that, you know, prayer is just impractical. It doesn't achieve anything. That's what they're implying when they say that sort of thing. They're wrong. According to Jesus, Praying for your enemies is one of the most practical and effective ways to love them. It is. And it's not posting on social media about praying for them. It's actually just praying for them. Actually praying for our enemies. Praying especially that God will grant them repentance and faith in his son Jesus so that they can be forgiven and enter his kingdom. Now, you might be sitting here thinking, well, you know what, how do I even start this? I, I don't, sometimes I don't want to pray for my enemy. Well, here's what John Stott writes. I think it's quite helpful and practical. Quote, we must not wait until we feel some love for our enemy before praying for them. We must begin to pray for him before we're even conscious of loving him. And what will happen is that we shall find our love Break first into a bud, he's talking it's a flower imagery, break first into a bud and then blossom when we start praying for our enemies. So praying for them is a way to increase our love for them. Now, it's, it's hard, isn't it? In fact, what Jesus is calling for is so unusual that it's never even crossed the mind of social media uh, people who run that stuff. You've noticed there's no pray for your enemies or pray for the hateful terrorists who blew up your family. Um, frame to put around your social, your, your, your profile picture. It doesn't exist. It, didn't, it could never even enter someone's mind to put that in. Which really illustrates Jesus' point in verse 45. What he's saying in verse 45 is, to love our enemies shows that we're part of a unique community. That we socialize with the Heavenly Father. That we're His children, verse 45, through faith in His Son. 
you guys know the saying, right? Like father, like son. Okay? Or like, uh, well, I guess nobody uses father, daughter, but it's the same sort of idea. Children look and act like their father. Right? And as you can see in verse 45, the father blesses all people without discrimination, indiscriminately, enemies included. He makes his son, just look at the words there, he, he makes his son rise on both the evil and the good, on, on people who live under Jesus' righteous rule, on people who hate God's rule. God, think about it. You ever read, like, uh, you pick up Richard Dawkins or a, a book of an atheist? God sends his sunshine on the atheist writing an angry book against him. God causes his son to rise on the Howard student who you think is the worst student you've met, the most evil student you've met. He does. And he sends his sunshine on everyone. If you have a phone with you, you can look on a world clock. It's got hundreds of cities on it, if you go to the world clock. A to Z. You know, you go Accra, Ghana, Zurich, Switzerland, and everything in between. There's hundreds of them. God causes his sun to rise from east to west to give sunlight to everyone on the planet. Everywhere. Australians. Ryan, you know, Australians, they're not all great, are they? You lived over there. North Koreans. Sri Lankans, Somalians, South Africans, Brazilians, even Americans. <laughs> God sent his, his son indiscriminately, S-U-N. He sends his rain indiscriminately. Now, usually the rain we have would be a nice illustration for this, but it, it's not because we've been flooded with so much rain that it's been destructive. But normally, and in this uh, context, rain is a blessing. God waters the crops, both of the just and the unjust. He fills the dams of both the wicked and the righteous. Those who are righteous by faith. You know, it's not like, it's not like this. God, you know, he takes the clouds and he zigzags them. Oh, this is a righteous person. I'll give them rain. I'm going to avoid this wicked person. He doesn't do that. He sends rain on wicked farmers to bless their crops. Now, think about this. That means that if your life is mostly sunshine and success, don't assume that you're necessarily a child of God because of that. Right? The Father showers all people with good gifts, even those who hate his guts, who ignore him. It's called common grace. If you hear that expression, common grace, that's what it's talking about. And here's the way it's, notice the passage. God's common grace is an engine that empowers his children to love our enemies. You know, it's, we have to say this all the time. Jesus never gives us bare commands. He never says, love your enemies and do this and do that without giving us the, 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 the motivation, the, the, the power to do it. And you see that here. See, it's through relationship with God the Father, through his Son, who loves us indiscriminately, that we can start to love like him. Now, obviously, we do not become God's children by trying really hard to love our enemies. That's not how it works. What Jesus is saying here is not that. He's saying, look, the way we show that we already have this relationship with the Father is when we act to some degree like our Father, like Father, like Son, when we love our enemies. Okay? And Jesus is really making the same point in verses 46 to 47. He's making it from another angle. He's saying, look, and think about this right now. If you don't love your enemies, you've never experienced love for your enemies, if you only love people who love you back, so what? You're not acting like the Father. You're not acting special. You're not acting different. You're acting just like everyone else. And he says there, look, even the most corrupt people in society, in that day tax collectors, love this way. And Jesus has quite a way with words because he knew the people he was talking to despised tax collectors. It's a bit like him saying to Julius Malema, look, you're acting just like Jan von Riebeck. He cuts into it. See, when we love those who love us back, 
It's just self-love. It's conditional. It's dependent upon the way they treat us. I'll scratch you, your back if you scratch mine. That's not that special. That's how the world operates. But the Father demands, and Jesus demands, far higher standard of righteousness. As he says in verse 48, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Love your enemies. Okay? Now, that's really what the passage is saying. Okay? And you might be sitting here, and if you're honest, you're saying, well, okay, I get what he's saying. I understand it. I grasp it mentally. But I have a problem with this. The first problem I have with this is that it's unjust. What about justice? I mean, think about it. Think about this country. If I love my enemies, my enemies are going to get away with evil. Someone can steal from me, assault me, oppress me, and live a happy life with no consequences ever. How is that fair? What about justice? Isn't God just? And if you wrestle with justice, I want to encourage you to attend Ryan's talk tomorrow night, right? Tomorrow, yeah. Three, 3 o'clock in L2. 3 o'clock L2. He's going to talk all about justice and how it applies to land. And I'd encourage you to attend that. I'm just going to say something quite short on this which is that the gospel announces that Jesus, who rose from the dead, that his resurrection proves that he is the man who will judge every human being, including all of us in this room, and he will do it righteously, with justice. As Romans 12 puts it, the Lord says, Vengeance, vengeance is mine, I will repay. I will repay those in Sri Lanka who did that. Don't worry, I will do it if they don't repent. And knowing that, knowing that God himself, who is all-powerful, will enact justice on his enemies, frees us up to love our enemies now. We don't have to take vengeance. God will do it. And before that day of judgment, God has provided governments who at least ought to punish evildoers, Romans 13. So it's not our role to personally avenge those who wrong us. Leave that to the law. Leave that to the government. Hopefully they'll do that. Maybe not. And again, that frees us to love our enemies, those who treat us poorly. Okay, so that's the first objection. Second objection is this. This is impossible. I like whoever did the advert out there is, is that's the right advert. This is impossible. Are you kidding me? Does Jesus really expect me to put this into practice? Let's be real. Let's be really real. This is impossible, isn't it? I mean, this sort of love, this quality of love, is so much higher and stronger than mere, the mere human love described in verses 46 and 47. I mean, when our enemies hurt us, we just automatically almost retaliate. And the thing is, when our enemies hurt us, it's actually right to hate the evil that they've done. There's nothing lovely about it. There's nothing in their evil that's lovable. It's morally ugly. By doing it, they've shown themselves to be morally ugly. And so to love an enemy is really to love someone unconditionally. They don't generate your love. <laughs> the love is generated by God's love for you. See, it's not, I love you because you love me. It's, I love you, even though I know you hate me. And left to ourselves, we will never love anyone like that. We lack the power. Here's the thing. If you've tuned out, tune back in. The Christian life is empowered by a relationship with a person, a unique person, Jesus. We can only, people, you know, you'll meet all sorts of people who talk about, I like to follow Jesus' teaching. Right? I have a neighbor like this. She's a very nice person. But she'll talk all about following Jesus' teaching. But you can't follow Jesus' teaching unless you follow him as a person. Unless you trust him as a person. See, if we've experienced Jesus' love for us, it's only if we've experienced his love for us that we'll be able to love like this. See, here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus lived what he preached. He's not a phony, like all of us to some degree. 
Sri Lanka was not the first time that a self-righteous religious, uh, re religious zealots killed an enemy. It happened at the cross. The religious leaders of Jesus' day plotted to have him crucified, didn't they? In Luke 23, you don't have to turn there, but I'd encourage you to read it. Luke 23 records some of the most sublime, gracious words ever uttered out of the mouth of a man. As Jesus' hate-filled enemies crucified him, perhaps as they were nailing his innocent wrists and feet to the wooden cross, Jesus prayed for those very people. He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That's love like no other love. And the haters didn't realize it, but you know, Jesus' death on the cross was the greatest display of God's love for his enemies. Because on the cross, Jesus died that death that his enemies, that we deserve for our sins, so that through faith in King Jesus, we can all be forgiven. And Romans 5 says this. Romans 5 says that God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, ugly rebels who hated him, Christ died for us. John 3.16. We hear this verse all the time. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What is the world in John's gospel? The world is the cruel, darkness-loving, God-hating, rebellious humanity. That's who God set his love on when he sent his son. And this may surprise you guys, but we were God's enemies. Some of us may still be his enemies. We were not physically there nailing him to the cross, but you know by nature we share that same hateful attitude towards him. You know, the loving Lord Jesus, he has a right to rule in every one of our lives. And how do we naturally respond? Deep-seated resentment. You don't have the right to rule me. I'll do whatever I want. And do you know what he says to, to us, to people like us, to people who trounce on him? with our rebellion. You know what he says to you? You know what he wants you to hear right now? I love you. I love you. I love you. I know you're warring against me, and I love you. And I have the nail scars to prove that I love you. I died for people like you. And so trust me as your king, Trust me to rule you, and I will forgive you and transform you from the inside out. See, common grace empowers us to love our enemies, but saving grace is an even more powerful engine. As you trust Jesus as your king, the king who died for you while you hated him, you will be able to start loving your enemies and my enemies. It's not easy, okay? It's not like the people grieving in Sri Lanka are just, it's going to come naturally. No. And grieving is, is, is normal and it's right. But with Jesus' help, it's possible. And I want to close with this example from history. It's Martin Luther King Jr., the Baptist minister who led the civil rights movement in the United States. And of course he had his faults, but here's what he said when people were kind of encouraging him to retaliate with violence against his enemies. Here's what he said. Quote, through violence, you may murder a hater, but you cannot murder hate through violence. Darkness cannot put out darkness. Only light can do that. And I say to you, I have decided to stick with love. And I'm not talking about emotional bosh when I talk about love, I'm talking about a strong, demanding love. For I've seen too much hate, and there's enough hate in our world, as you know. If you are seeking the highest good, I think that you can find it through love. And the beautiful thing is that we aren't moving wrong when we do it, because John the Apostle was right. God is love. He who hates does not know God, 
But he who loves has the key that unlocks the door to the meaning of ultimate reality. More accurately, ultimate reality is God who is love. And we see his love for his enemies at the cross. And so, in our hate-filled world, in a world of where Sri Lanka things happen all the time, those who follow a crucified Jesus, which is many of you, we have an opportunity to stand out from the crowd. And we're not left to our own resources. We've got common grace, God's kindness to all to empower us to love our enemies, and we've got the saving grace of God shown to us at the cross to empower us to love the way God loves us. And so as we conclude, let's just put this into practice. If you are a believer here, I want you to take a minute to think about one enemy. One enemy. One person on this planet who you naturally do not like, who has maybe hurt you really badly. And I want us to just do something very simple in our own hearts quietly in prayer, which is to pray for God to bless them.